Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. It is quite bizarre that I'm in a room here where every single person, except the speaker, has an accent. <laughs> How strange is that? And they're the sort of odds we deal with with climate change. The challenge is, if we use the IPCC figures, 3% of annual emissions of carbon dioxide are from humans. You therefore must argue that that 3% drives climate. And we have to forget that how wonderful this planet is, how it always changes, how climate always changes. We know that pollution kills. We know that this planet is dynamic. And we know that we've had many, many climate changes in the past driven by the orbit of the Earth, driven by solar activity and other features which are not quite cyclical, like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and other oscillations. So climate always changes. Those on the other side say that I'm a climate denier. Maybe they should read a 19th century geology textbook before they start throwing words around. Climate always changes. And it is within this change that we need to try to find if humans have absolutely anything to do with it at all. As a geologist, I go back just to the last 500 million years. That's nothing in geological time. But the blue line is a rough indication of temperature. In the last 500 million years, we have had four ice ages within which we've had many very cold times, glaciation, that's when you were covered by ice, and warmer times, an interglacial, and we're living in one of those. Our current ice age started 34 million years ago. We've had six ice ages in the history of planet Earth. Six out of these six ice ages started when the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere was higher than now. So the geological evidence is saying, well, there's something fundamentally wrong. What we do see is that over time, atmospheric carbon dioxide has been decreasing. It's a major gas in the atmosphere of, of Venus, of Mars, and the outer planets. It is a major gas that comes out of planet Earth. And what I want to look at a little bit later is how we sequester this gas naturally. So climates change, and we have to ask the question, are the experiences we have today unprecedented? The answer is a two-letter word, no, definitely not. We are in an interglacial. We are probably getting towards the end of the interglacial. God help you in Alberta if you have a glaciation because you will be covered in ice and you will not be able to grow wheat and other crops. And we've seen in past interglacials, they have been warmer. We also see in past interglacials that the polar bears didn't seem to worry too much about it. They just moved. So we are seeing nothing unusual in the history of this planet. And I'm sorry for your ego, but it's not a special world you live in just because you live here. We also see that with sea levels, nothing special is happening. If we look back at one of the more ancient glaciations some 700 million years ago, we had a sea level change of only 1,500 metres. That's the sea level change, not this pathetic millimetre that people are worried about. In the last interglaciation, it was about seven metres. And I'll show you a bit later, in my part of the world, we've actually had a sea level fall. And that's been about one and a half to two metres. And we hear these catastrophic stories about how these island nations in the Pacific living on co coral atolls will drown as sea level rises. Sorry, folks, go and read Charles Darwin's book of 1842. Who show, and he showed that as volcanoes were sinking, coral atolls kept growing. That was validated by drilling that was done in the late 19th century and again in the mid 20th century. So we have a lot of misinformation out there. There are a very large number of reasons why sea level changes. There are some places today where sea level is actually falling others where it's rising, and the land is rising and falling. So you cannot talk about sea level without talking about the land. But let's go to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, a climate a little bit different from here. And we have, bottom right, a layer of oysters, well above the high tide mark there, 
And these oysters we've been able to carve and date. And these oyster shells are saying that sea level was about one and a half to two metres higher some 5,000 years ago. So that's in my part of the world. Sea level was higher. It's actually been falling. And we see this because at low tide you get micro-atolls of corals. Uh, these micro-atolls are basically a whole community that's thriving. But all along the coast of eastern Australia we find dead micro-atolls. This is where they have been exposed to the air because we've had a relative sea level fall. And we can go and look at these micro-atolls, measure their age, measure where they are relative to sea level, and we can see that in fact, with quite a substantial amount of data, with the error bars there, sea level has been falling in eastern Australia. Now what I haven't told you is the sea level isn't falling at all, it's the land that is rising. So you cannot look at sea level and just say, oh, we're all going to drown and die because sea level's rising. It is not true. We go to northern Scandinavia, and we see that Scandinavia, like you, was covered in kilometres of ice. And underneath the crust is fairly plastic material. And so you sink when you're covered in ice. And when that ice is gone, you rise. And this is what's been happening in Scandinavia. We've had a substantial land rise of about 340 metres, we see the same here, we see the same in Scotland. Scotland's rising and South East England is sinking. The Netherlands is sinking. So the land goes up and the land goes down and it's very hard to compute sea levels based on just looking at sea level. And we see this here in Scandinavia. We've been able to plot the uplift rates. These are very, very high uplift rates. And when we look at that period of, of uh, the world, we can see that we've had a sea level rise um, in parts of the Northern Hemisphere. In other parts, such as where I live, we've had a sea level fall. So it depends upon where you measure and what you measure as to what sea level is doing. So when someone tries to frighten you about what sea level is doing, ask them what the land is doing. Is the land rising? Is the land falling? And the answer is, where you measure it in the earth, you get a very different story. We can compute from the ice records, what has happened with temperature and with carbon dioxide. And temperature and carbon dioxide do not go hand in hand. And this information is well established in the literature. After temperature rises, maybe 800 years later, you start to get a rise in carbon dioxide. It is temperature that's driving the atmospheric carbon dioxide content. It is not the inverse. We see that from ice core measurements. And we see today, in, in today's world, we see, as we heard earlier, temperature is going down. Carbon dioxide is going up. So on three scales, the geological scale, the ice core scale, and the scale in your life, three score and 10 years, we see that there's no relationship between that trace gas in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, and temperature. That's very well established. But being the sceptic I am, I'm concerned about temperature. Where do you measure it? How do you measure it? How accurate are the results? We have had a great decrease in the number of temperature measuring stations. Most of these have been in the Arctic since the Soviet Union collapsed, and the record now is quite incomplete. The primary information, as we learned from the University of East Anglia, is actually amended before it's published. So what we are getting today are amended temperature results. Now, here we've got a measuring station in Arizona that's been there since 1867. And this is telling us that temperature is increasing. Well, this, this makes you panic, doesn't it? Except when you look at this Stevenson screen, getting hot exhaust fumes, back reflection from concrete, back reflection from buildings. And the work that Anthony Watts has done in the United States has shown that 89% of the official temperature measuring stations have this bias. That bias needs to be corrected. And this correction has been done from looking at various counties in California, looking at the population, and looking at how much urban areas generate heat. And normally the corrections are for populations of less than 100,000. We know from work that's been done in Alaska that you've only got to have a small village and it warms up the local environment. So what you have to do is, once you've measured temperature, you have to adjust that primary data. 
and it depends upon how you adjust it as to the answer you get, as to whether it were warming or cooling. And that worries me. That worries me in terms of basic measurement. Satellite measurements also have to be adjusted. They don't show us a catastrophic story. Uh, satellite measurements uh, have um, been tweaked many times to give us results which um, uh, tell us that we're getting warming and cooling, or cooling and warming, depending on which hemisphere you're in. And then there's modelling. Oh dear, modelling. Various models using, in effect, the same algorithm, using, in effect, the same data, have gone to show us that somewhere high in the atmosphere, above the equatorial regions, there must be a warm patch of air. And this is using our current increase in carbon dioxide and uh, using all the information that's put into these models. Well, you can test that model and you can test it with radiosonde balloons, which don't show that at all. Other balloon measurements um, have measured temperature, but have also measured wind, and people have measured wind and then readjusted that to what temperature should be and shown the inverse. But direct empirical measurements contradict models, and that's what the models are. They are models. They are not predictions. Uh, they are an understanding based on a very limited amount of information we put in. And these are the models for ocean temperatures. And bear in mind that the oceans hold far more heat than the atmosphere. It's the oceans that drive the weather and climate. And the models are telling us that the oceans are going to warm. What happens if you measure it? Empiricism, you get a different story. The oceans are slightly cooler. So, we have to be very sceptical of models. Or what about this gas that's meant to be poisonous, that's meant to be a pollutant, that is carbon dioxide? Well, in my book, carbon dioxide is plant food. Without carbon dioxide, we have no life on Earth. And it very much depends upon how you measure it. The black line is a measurement uh, that's been around for a long period of time, a very expensive measurement technique, and there are some 90,000 measurements that show that carbon dioxide increases and decreases quite markedly. That expensive technique was stopped in the late 50s, and an infrared technique, which is the far right, was used for measurement in Hawaii. Bear in mind that 86% of measurements are rejected, and this is the result you get. Now, there has been no correlation between these two techniques. The bottom red line is carbon dioxide in bubbles in ice. And these bubbles we know in solid rocks will move, they'll also move in another solid rock called ice. So we've got no correlation between carbon dioxide measuring techniques. But let's just assume that the infrared measurements are correct and we'll use that for the rest of today's discussion. That we have a change in carbon dioxide content. Well, so what? If we double carbon dioxide or quadruple carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the spectroscopists have shown with this delightfully named law called the Beer Law, the spectroscopists have shown that if we double the carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere, it has very little effect on temperature. It's the first 20 or 100 parts per million that drives the temperature. After that, it has very little effect. Now, we can validate that from geology. Because throughout most of geological time, we have had an atmosphere with a much higher carbon dioxide content. At some times, it had up to 30% carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Yet, we didn't have a runaway greenhouse. But we had ice ages. So it's very clear that carbon dioxide does a job of slightly warming us, especially at low concentrations. After that, job done. So doubling of carbon dioxide, we don't need it to worry about it. And many people have done calculations where if you burn all the known fossil fuels, you still won't double it. Because the main greenhouse gas is water vapour, and much of the argument about climate is what happens if you increase the carbon dioxide content a little bit, what does that do to water vapour? And we know 